Hello, welcome. My name is Nolifus, and today I'll be going over the various map styles of Trackmania. I've noticed a few players not really understanding what some styles actually are, so I'm covering them all. First, I'll cover the more common map styles, what you're more likely to run into if you play the campaign, track of the day, the arcade room, etc. Then some more niche categories you may run into, but not too often. I'll be going over what each category is, what to expect, and since this is a mapping channel, I'll also be throwing in a couple things about mapping these styles as well. For the record, I was finishing up the script when I saw Lemming TV post their map style video. I'm so sorry. I promise I didn't just steal your video idea. This is a big video and I've been working on it for a while. I think we're taking different enough approaches to the topic that it should be fine, but either way, go check out his map building series. He's really good at getting a lot of information across in a short amount of time, something I'm not so great at. Don't you dare look at the runtime of this video. But anyway, check him out. Link will be in the description. Okay. I think that's everything, so let's get started. And the first style I'll be going over is Trackmania's most iconic, Tech. Tech is short for technical, as in technical skill. With a name like that, you bet that this is going to be one of the more challenging styles. Speaking of which, there's three I consider to be the most skill intensive with the widest gaps between the pros and average players, and Tech is one of them. The main mechanic this style is based around is drifting. This is when you're trying to turn, but the car has too much speed to make it, but instead of releasing gas, you press the brake. The car starts slowing down, but the tires also lose grip and you start seeing skid marks. Thanks to the loss of grip, your car is now at a much sharper angle it would otherwise be at and can now make the tight turn, staying at a much higher speed than would otherwise be possible. This is a drift. Unless you're very new to the game, you've probably already done this without realizing it. It's a very simple mechanic, but very challenging to push to its limit. The difficulty comes with knowing how to take the turn and how long to press brake for so that the car narrowly misses the walls and preserves as much speed as possible. Tech maps are dedicated to these turns, and the reason why average players lose so much time is that even if you only lose a tenth of a second per turn, there's quite a few drifts in a tech map that can easily add up to over a second by the finish line. Because of the grip your surfaces required, you'll typically only see tech maps made out of road and platform blocks. There are a couple of subgenres of tech. One is a lot bigger than the other, and the smaller substyle I'll go over now doesn't really have a name that I see. These maps still have the trademark style of tight corners on road where the car is sliding through them, but instead of having to press brake, there's a slipperier surface in between these turns. That way, the player can determine the angle of the car heading into the turn, and hopefully the change in grip from one surface to another will act as a drift and carry the car through the bend. It's Debatable if this style is actually tech, but it's similar and prominent enough that I wanted to give it a mention. Anyway, tech, actual tech, was the premier competitive map style for a very long time due to the skill required to get the best times, and still remains a very popular genre to this day. Due to the skill involved with drifting, mapping tech is also quite a challenge. If you aren't comfortable with manipulating the car and familiar with how momentum carries, the drifts you make could end up being really weird and awkward for other players. If you are new and want to try mapping a tech map, I would recommend getting someone with more experience to give you feedback as you build. The best advice I ever got from mapping is to make sure that the fastest way through the turn is the correct line. If what would normally be a perfect drift through a corner puts the player in a bad spot for the next element, it can be really frustrating, like the mapper was going out of the way to punish the best players. Not really what you should be hoping for. There is a lot more to mapping and driving tech, but these are the basics. Sometimes it really is faster to press brake. Speaking of going faster, it's the perfect time to go over the bigger subsection of tech, speed tech. Because this is still tech, the focus of these maps are still on drifting tight corners, but the entire route is much faster. A lot of normal tech takes place in 4th gear. Before you can gear up to gear 5, the map makes you drift back down. Speed tech, however, is all about that 5th gear. 
You're still slowing down for the turns, but not nearly as much, which makes keeping your momentum and higher speeds very important. At least the threat of improper gear management is much less. With the higher speeds, corners and obstacles tend to give players more room to set up and recover from each drift, and because of these reasons, speed tech is considered to be a little easier than normal tech. It's still difficult, and the gap between the pros and average Joes is massive, but it's a couple less things to worry about. Since it's a bit easier and you're going at higher speeds, newer players find speed tech to be a great intro to the style. And the same goes for mapping. It's still difficult to map a proper speed tech route, but at least you can be a little lenient on a couple things. The most important thing to remember is still making sure the fastest way through a turn is the intended line. Speed tech is all about momentum as well, so don't build drifts that completely kill the speed. Hopefully with the past couple sections, tech doesn't seem as scary. It's all about taking a simple skill and pushing it to the max. And speed tech is just a faster version but it's not the fastest map style not by a long shot nope that crown would go to full speed the name pretty much suggests what it'll be about and it's very accurate these maps are focused on speed and gaining as much of it as possible while driving through high speed elements a misconception among newer players is that full speed is beginner friendly I mean, you literally never press the brake, going fast is exciting, and the elements often include very flashy inversions. The other side of full speed is that the style is one of the most mechanically intensive and challenging the game has to offer. Remember when I said that there were three styles I considered to have the largest skill gaps? Full speed is another one of them. It might seem simple at first, just go fast, but there's a huge difference between a route that goes fast and a proper full speed map. The main mechanic players have to learn if they want good times is speed slides. There's also the ability to take those high speed elements with the best line possible, but those elements are more optional while speed sliding isn't. Basically, past 400 speed, keeping full grip is no longer the best strategy for gaining the most speed possible. Speed slides include overlapping your skid marks made by your front and back tires. The overlap amount varies quite a bit depending on the surface and speed you're driving on, but the general rule of thumb is that the faster you're going, the more overlap you want. If the map isn't built with these specific speed slides in mind, it's not full speed, flat out. Speaking of these different surfaces, full speed is one of the rare styles that literally any surface can be turned into. Platform is the most common, but ice and even wet plastic full speed maps do come up every once in a while. Since any surface can become full speed, I won't cover that fact when I talk about the different surfaces, but keep that in mind. There's nothing about full speed that says it has to include a certain surface. Instead, it's all about those speed slides. Since this is a very mechanical map style, this is one of those styles with the largest dedicated player base. And with that dedicated player base comes a lot of people who have a very specific idea on what full speed is. I've personally played a map that I was convinced was full speed, but when I asked if it was, I was told a resounding no. The map had a couple turns that required the player to turn past the point of speed sliding, slowing down the car, and those couple of turns disqualified it from being a proper full speed map, despite 90% of the map being about speed slides. The reason I'm bringing this up isn't to poke fun at how picky the full speed community is, although I think they're being a little picky but to show how dedicated this style is to speed slides, and that is going to carry over into mapping. Because of just how narrow that definition is and how hard these speed slides are to get right, full speed is one of the most challenging map styles to build, in, in my opinion at least. And it makes sense. At those speeds, variance is going to be massive, and if those speed slides between elements aren't properly calculated, players are going to go flying off the map or have to worsen their driving to get a better time, neither being ideal. If you want to build a full speed map, you better be good at the style or have someone who is take a look and provide feedback. Just remember, it's all about speed slides, don't forget to speed slide, and when in doubt, speed slide. So if full speed isn't the fast, simple style that beginners tend to love, what is? If only there was a style that lets you get a lot of speed while the primary focus is on having fun without the complicated mechanics. 
Oh wait, speed fun. This is the style that is more defined by what other styles aren't. If your map goes fast but has some overslides, speed fun. If it has a couple drifts but not too many, speed fun. If it has a few jumps, speed fun. You get the idea. While some other styles have hard rules, speed fun is what you get when you take inspiration without fully committing to that style. The only stipulation is that you're still going fast. Not as fast as full speed, but comfortably in gear 5 for the most part. It's difficult to talk about what to expect because the definition is so broad. Oftentimes, speed fun is the style that new players will build without realizing it. Since they might try out a style without understanding the quote unquote rules of that style, so the map just ends up in the speed fun category. Because of this, the style gets a bit of a noob trap reputation, but that also doesn't mean you can't get an expertly crafted map in this area. A lot of experimentation and innovation finds its home here, making the genre extremely versatile. When it comes to mapping, speed fun is probably the easiest to build. You can build in whatever elements you think fits without the restraint of just one style. The trickiest parts being that the transitions between those elements have to make sense, and that gear 5 isn't being dropped too often. Basically, go wild. Just make sure you're having fun. Next up is a style that's not seen very often, NASCAR. Think tech, but instead of drifting, the turns are a bit wider, so releasing the gas ends up being faster. The name comes from the American Racing League as the map inspiration is pretty obvious. Well, besides the loops. Inversions and other elements can be included as long as the release turns are still the main focus. Although airtime and constant transitions are pretty rare. Other surfaces can make an appearance on a map, but a vast majority of it will be built with road. And the maps themselves tend to be pretty fast and in the fifth gear. Since you're going fast on the roadblocks, precision is very important. And it's the precision style with little room for error that NASCAR finds itself in a tough spot in the community, as one little error can cost multiple seconds, more so than other styles. Because of this, a lot of players find driving NASCAR tedious and overly punishing, as well as the lack of other mechanics present kind of boring. Still, there are players who love the style and cheer for the annual NASCAR track of the day. As far as mapping, NASCAR is on the simpler side. The most difficult part will be calculating the route so the player isn't releasing the gas for several seconds at a time or having a few drifts end up being faster. As long as you're giving ample room for turning and setting up for those turns, you have a winning recipe for a NASCAR map. Now you just have to convince map review it's a good style. Dirt. More of a surface rather than a specific map style. There are a few directions you can go, but they all have stuff in common. Namely, it's a dirt map, so there has to be a lot of dirt. As a surface, if you're gear 3 or below, you want to retain grip and not slide. While gear 4 or 5, you should be sliding slightly to gain more speed. A common technique is called wiggling, where you steer back and forth to maintain a constant slide without turning. Dirt will also immediately get rid of wet wheels, so it's not uncommon for dirt to get paired with water. When it comes to dirt roads, the most common lines will be on the outside of the dirt turn. This is because turning on a slippery surface causes you to slide, which will lose you speed. The less you slide, the less you lose. The edges of the dirt roadblocks are slanted, so the curve of the block itself can also help you turn. Outside dirt turns aren't always the case, but it's good to do it where you can. The most common elements you'll see on these maps are various turns and transitions while you're in a lower gear. By lower gear, I mean not gear 5. Since dirt is a slippery surface, more competitive maps will feature tight corners to try to throw the player off their line. By having the player be in gear 3 or 4, there's not only the threat of gearing down, but also the danger of gearing up, forcing the player to then gear back down to the proper gear. Also, why it's important to take those outside dirt turns when you can. You're probably meant to. There's other mechanics, but these are the basics and what you can typically expect. When mapping, I'd rate dirt about average difficulty. There are definitely dirt maps out there that are very difficult to map properly, but creating a smooth, flowy dirt map isn't too challenging. 
The most important aspect is paying attention to gears. If the car shifts gears while you are sliding, you get a bad gear change which slows you down. So having the car taking a dirt turn when it naturally wants to change gears isn't ideal. It's up to you to change the route a bit to have better gear changes throughout. Outside of gears, there's not too much to focus on right away. Since dirt is more of a broad surface, the style you choose to focus on will help you determine most of the route. You can make things a bit easier by using mainly wide platform blocks, or restrict the player and test their ability to drive that outside line on the dirt road pieces. Or a mix. It's your map. Do whatever you want. Just remember to get those gear changes cleanly, wiggle when you're gear 4 or up, take those outside dirt lines where possible, and dry those wet tires. The next surface we'll go over is grass. Somewhat similar to dirt, but slipperier. Grass also doesn't immediately dry your tires, so maybe it's not too similar to dirt. But the same rules apply with wiggles. Gear 3 or below, keep your grip. While gear 4 and up, you constantly want to be sliding a bit. Except for those gear changes. Keep those clean. With the reduced grip, there's really only three options for full grass maps. Two, we've already talked about with grass full speed being a common subgenre, and sliding on grass being a great setup for those road tech-ish turns. The only one I haven't mentioned are commonly referred to as Gear 4 grass maps. The idea is pretty simple, stay in Gear 4. The map, however, will complicate that idea. A couple reasons this is different from dirt is that unless you're using custom blocks, grass only comes in platforms, and the reduced grip really puts more emphasis on setting up properly for the elements, as if you have to adjust your line in the middle of something, you'll be slowing down a lot more. Technically, you could do this at any gear, but most maps will choose gear 4. Gear 5 is also decent, but with gear 4 it adds that extra obstacle of avoiding the gear up. Gear 3 is an option, but the map would have to make some tight turns to keep you there. And with how slippery grass is, tight turns just cause the car to slide out, which isn't very fun. With how predictable grass tends to be, veterans of the game tend to look at it as a boring surface. Just because they feel like they've already played what new grass maps have to offer. Still, there is a lot of room to experiment, and a good map is fun to drive regardless. So that's what you can typically expect with grass maps. As far as mapping goes, I would consider grass one of the easier surfaces to build. Just like with dirt, gears are going to be the biggest obstacle. Unlike dirt, you mostly have platform blocks to work with. And it's pretty tricky to include tight turns unless you sprinkle in a different surface. So pick a style you would like to pair with the surface, the most common being full speed, that sort of tech, and gear 4, and see what you can do. As long as the gears are clean, it can't be that bad. Just make sure you're setting up for elements correctly. Grass isn't the best surface for making corrections midterm. And once you're gear four, wiggle. Plastic is up next. It drives fairly similar to grass, and I mean it this time. There are a few differences, but the driving styles are going to be pretty close to each other. Plastic is a bit slipperier than grass and also features the highest acceleration rate of any other surface, so you'll be getting up to gear much faster than usual. Another weird thing about plastic are those wiggles. You definitely want to do them here, but you can start doing them at gear 3 instead. Still want to get those gear changes smoothly though. Plastic is a bit of a wild child, honestly. There are some other properties that plastic has that make it somewhat infamous. Bounces are possible, and the car doesn't get acceleration penalty for hitting plastic walls. This opens up the possibility of quite a few unique elements not possible on any other surface. But the most infamous feature is plastic's interaction with water. Remember when I said dirt dries wheels instantly? Well, plastic never dries them. As long as you're driving on plastic, your wheels will never dry out leading the way for one of the most hated substyles in the game, wet plastic. Wet plastic is the most slippery surface in the game. No, I'm not talking about you yet. Get out of here. You're different. And takes the concept of momentum and pushes it to 11. Because you're sliding around everywhere, it's very important to maintain control of the car. Otherwise, you'll end up sliding into bad lines and slowing down immensely trying to correct it. If a map is labeled as plastic, you can never know what to expect. It might be a gear 4 normal-ish route or a waterlogged bouncy castle. Because of the wide variety, mapping plastic is a bit weird to rate on the difficulty scale. 
For making more traditional maps, it's about the same as grass. With more off the wall ideas, it's up to the mapper. This is the surface you can do some truly crazy things on. So if torture machines are more your speed, map to your heart's content. And don't let anyone else tell you to uninstall. Speaking of people telling you to uninstall the game and never build another map, let's talk about ice. Technically, the surface with the least amount of grip, but I don't consider it slippery in the traditional context. Because when it comes to ice, it's all about those ice slides. Ice slides weren't a mechanic intended to be in the game, it sort of just happened. And because of this, there are a lot of weird things that can happen with the surface. To give a very brief overview, when driving ice, unless you're going in a straight line, it's not the fastest to point your car where you want to be going. Instead, you want to ice slide around those corners. What this means is that you swivel your car 90 degrees with the nose pointing towards the inside of the turn. Then, you turn your wheels the opposite direction you're turning. So if you're turning right, point your car all the way to the right, then point your tires to the left. This will initiate an ice slide. I know I've harped about gears a lot, but this is where they get very important. If you switch gears while in an ice slide, you get a slide out. Your car loses all grip and you just slide out of control. So to avoid that, it's very important to try to keep your car at the 90 degree angle. In gear 4, you get a lot more leniency as it seems to be a lot harder to swap gears than the others. But to start out, stick with 90 degrees. If you need to adjust your turn, don't adjust your tires. It won't do anything. Instead, the controls now become brake to turn tighter and release to widen or straighten out the car. But don't adjust your turn too much or else you'll get a slide out. The perfect ice turn is where you initiate an ice slide and make no adjustments as the car naturally comes out of it. If this all seems incredibly unintuitive, you're correct. Nearly every new player hates ice with a passion and several people just flat out refuse to play it, let alone learn it. It's so difficult, I consider it that third style where the gaps between the average players and pros is so massive. There's a lot more to ice slides, such as how the ice slides change in each gear, the surface has its own wiggles, and where to implement ice 360s. That a proper intro to playing ice definitely deserves its own video, but I should at least go over icy tires for a moment. Just like how tires get wet when they touch water, the wheels freeze while on ice, and take a moment to thaw out when transferring to another surface which can be a bit weird as your tires start out super slippery and then they get more grip over the course of a couple seconds. Also, you can do this really cool pivot turn on dirt with icy tires. Trippy, but fun. Personally, I really like ice. Once you put in half an hour to learn what you're doing, the entire surface becomes much more fun with an infinitely scaling skill ceiling. But once you're starting out, it's confusing, frustrating, and maddening as you're sliding out for what seems like no reason. There's a reason, I promise, and you can understand it. As far as what to expect when driving, it's all about those ice slides. If your car is at an angle and you're not ice sliding, you slow down very quickly. So ice maps are typically all about turn after turn coming in and out of ice slides smoothly. Most of the time you'll be in either gear 4 or 3 as those are the most friendly to ice sliding and for the best mappers of ice they understand how frustrating the surface can be so they'll leave the expert tricks out for the most part. Speaking of mapping, building a typical ice map is an impossible challenge if you don't know ice slides and not too difficult once you have that base understanding. Unless you have access to custom items, you'll be using nothing but platform blocks for ice, meaning you'll be including a bit more room which can help the forgiveness of the maps. The most important part of making an ice route is making sure it's not too easy to slide out during the turns. If it is, you'll have most players ripping their hair out in frustration. If you're just starting out, I would recommend staying in gear 4 while building, most forgiving gear. And if you're really starting out, take the time to get a base understanding of how ice slides work. You'll learn that ice is actually fun and probably get a much better div than usual in cup of the day. Next up, we have another divisive one, bobsled. This type of map gets its name from the Olympic sport since that's 
pretty much what you're doing. In order for a map to be a bobsled map, it has to use the bobsled block specifically. These maps are usually very momentum based, not unlike full speed, just without the speed slides. Since the blocks themselves are made out of ice, it's difficult to try to slow the player down. Because of that, builders typically decide to either build their maps with the goal of gaining as much speed as possible, or having bobsled portions come in sections, with the areas in between made of something different to slow the player down. If the bobsled is broken up into parts, it will almost always be the turns. Otherwise, you're just kind of driving in a straight line. In order to drive well, the general rule of thumb is to try to stay in between the two red lines during the turn. The more you wiggle or slide during the bobsled portions, the slower you'll go. Well, mostly? The pros do a wiggle at the end of each turn, but I'm not a pro, so I don't know how to do it. Anyway, you don't need to learn it to get a decent time, so don't worry about it too much. If you want to learn it, you can, it's just part of the basics, you'll be fine without it. Setting yourself up during the entry of the turn to hit that line smoothly is more important. During the turn, if you're under 400 speed, you only want to steer around 80%, which is action key 4. If you're over 400 speed, full steering is preferred. There's a lot more to bobsled if you really want to get good with it, such as those wiggles, but those are the basics. Keep smooth lines, don't oversteer, and set yourself up for success in the entry of the turn. Because of the precision required and the fact that taking a turn well means staying in one place on the wall, a lot of players consider this style boring. Despite this, Bobsled has a small but dedicated fan base that has actually grown a bit with the console release. A bit ironic since precision is usually a very frustrating skill to be tested on, especially if you're new, but Trackmania's most popular content creator, Virtual, is one of the world's best bobsled players and it's one of his favorite styles. With that large of a voice saying the style is a lot of fun, it's going to start winning some people over. And I've noticed a lot more new players will include a bobsled portion in their first couple maps, which is pretty cool. When mapping a style, I would rate it a bit easier than most just to get a baseline decent map. Obviously making a great bobsled map is going to be difficult, but for the basics it's not too bad. The big thing to pay attention to is the entry of each turn and making sure the player can take it cleanly. The bad part of new players including bobsled turns in their first map is that I've seen a lot of messy entries, so make sure it's smooth. Other than that, try to keep the map interesting with a few different elements as just turn after turn can be pretty bland. Most people break it up with something else as 100% bobsled maps are very rare for this reason. Keep in mind if you want to go either in a full speed direction or you want to control the player's speed a bit more. Either way should be fine and that's pretty much bobsled. Drive those clean entries, stay in between those red lines, and try not to fall asleep at the wheel. More likely a few blocks rather than a full map, but sausage maps do exist. As a surface, it has the same properties as road, except for that bump. Because of the raised surface, sausage tends to be pretty punishing, as if you're off the intended line, it's very easy to go flying off the side. That can also be a feature though, and sausage is often used as a little jump, either as a transition or speed check, or to force the player to be on one side of the road for an upcoming element. Because of the weird shape of the block, it's pretty rare for a dedicated sausage map to pop up, and it's mostly used in little sections on other styles of maps. If a map is made out of mostly sausage, it's most likely to be tech. The drifts can be a bit trickier given the more narrow lines you have to work with, but there's also the possibility of hopping into the turn making the setups a bit easier, which makes the differences stand out and can give tech a bit of a new flavor with these blocks. Outside of those tricks, the surface is very similar to road given that they have the same physics. As far as mapping sausage goes, I'd say it's average difficulty. As long as the drifts are calculated and the jump slash transitions work well, there's not too much to worry about. Speaking of those transitions, don't make the jumps themselves too large, otherwise the car is going to rotate in the air and can give you an awkward landing. And large jumps just aren't that fun in the first place. Outside of that, just see what you can come up with when working with the unique shape, and be prepared for those sausage related jokes in the map review server. The most uncommon surface, probably I don't have any data to back this up, water. There's two main options people tend to build when working with water. The more common is including water bounces in the map. 
This one is pretty simple. If the car is going fast enough, it'll hop along the surface of the water like a rock when thrown a certain way. Steering, when the car makes contact with the water, will throw the car in that direction, but will also lose you a bunch of speed. So it's probably best to line the car up before the water bounce so you don't have to do that. The car can't accelerate while on the surface of the water, so water bounce sections tend to be short, around one to two bounces, and if the car is slow enough, it'll sink. Which brings us to the second option when driving with water, underwater driving. And it's weird, to say the least. The game kind of feels like you're driving in slow motion and the car doesn't fall very fast. So it's liable to just hang in the water for a moment before sinking when there's an elevation change. Which means you aren't accelerating and you lose a lot of time when you don't have that wheel contact. Unless it's just some map someone decided to submerge in water, underwater routes are often paired with reactor down. This way, the car will still accelerate faster than a snail and maintain decent grip. But not too much, as it's still very common to start sliding. It's hard to describe the differences between regular and underwater driving as it's really different. But a very niche style has emerged called underwater reactor tech, and it is exactly what it sounds like. The car has reactor down, there are a lot of sharp corners, and it's all underwater. What a combination. Water also has some pretty interesting mechanics when interacting with other surfaces. If your car touches water, your wheels will get wet. When you have wet tires, you're much more prone to losing grip. And sliding under these conditions makes your car carry much less forward momentum, so it's best avoided where possible. As stated before, dirt will immediately dry your tires, so it's pretty common to encounter a bit of dirt coming out of the water, but your tires will dry normally over the course of a few seconds anyway. Well, most of the time. Remember, when paired with plastic, your tires never dry out, making water and plastic a particularly nasty combo that will have most players complaining. When building with water, there's really so many places you can go. It's a surface that's best explored just doing whatever and seeing what works. So good luck. Players driving your map will need it. Those are most of the surfaces individually, so let's talk about mixed. These are the maps that combine a few different surfaces into one map. The most popular combination is road, dirt, and grass, but any combo will do. These maps tend to focus more on the flow of the map and seeing how various surfaces and transitions interact with each other. Since the possibilities are so wide, it's typically paired with another style to rein in the ideas into something more cohesive. Some of the more common directions are tech, gear 4 maps, and full speed to give some examples. Mixed isn't too difficult to build in and of itself, a lot of the difficulty will depend on the style you pair it with. Flow is pretty important to keep in mind, so try to find a smooth path between elements and try to think of good variations on the surfaces that make sense. Basically, don't force awkward elements and transitions just because. If there's a certain part that catches everyone by surprise, you might want to take another look at it. Other than that, go for it. There's a lot of interesting interactions between the various surfaces, so see what you can find. Swapping between all those surfaces, though, is going to require some transitions, and the style dedicated to that idea is transitional. For most of the blocks, the editor comes with ways to piece them together. Sometimes you come across pieces that don't fit nicely, or sometimes you just think the vanilla blocks are boring. Creative transitions are also a great way to change elevation. These maps focus on unique ways to get across the route and test the player's ability to see the proper lines, precision in executing them, and how well they can carry speed. Depending on the transitions used, the maps range in difficulty quite a bit, and since the focus isn't on the surfaces, all blocks are fair game. So when driving, try to stay on the proper racing line and you should be good. The maps tend to be pretty punishing when you're off of them. Of course, that's easier said than done. As far as mapping, I consider transitional to be a decently difficult style to build. It's hard to try to come up with cool ways to get the car through a gap that works for a majority of players, and this is one of the styles that falls victim to the mapper making things way more challenging than intended. I mean, you're the one who put it together, so you're going to know how to take it smoothly, while the proper way might not be very obvious to someone seeing it for the first time. And this is where I say it's okay to steal ideas from other mappers, but you, you have to do it right. 
Since it's going to be very rare for someone to think of a completely new transition that no one else has thought of, as long as you're just taking the two or three blocks that make up the element itself and not the route leading up to and away from it, copying and pasting should be fine. Basically, the newness of the map should come from the twists and turns of the route, not necessarily the transitions themselves. But if you have a new idea and you think it works pretty well, by all means, use it. The main point is to learn which transitions work and why they're good, because if you can get good at transitions, it's one of the skills you can bring to other maps and make them more interesting, regardless of style. So I think it's something budding mappers should at least look into. Just like in script writing, transitions can be difficult, but well worth the effort to make them flow. Wait, what? It took a while for Nadeo to remember these exist for their campaigns. Multilap. I'm not going to spend very much time on this because the idea is very simple. Instead of the more common separate start and finish blocks, the car begins and ends the map on the same block. But what really makes it a multi-lap map and the namesake is the car has to cross the finish line multiple times after collecting all the checkpoints every lap. A simple concept that some people have had some really creative ideas with. Most of the time you'll be driving the same route again each lap, but since you carry speed into the second lap, some people build two or more routes. One you start off with and another the player can now jump to with the increased speed. As long as the car passes through the start finish block again, it's fair game. Just make sure that if you're building two separate routes, you either use the same checkpoints or linked checkpoints, otherwise it won't work. Since that's the only criteria, any surface or style can be multi-lap. One of the most common pairings are multi-lap and NASCAR. I mean, real life NASCAR is lap, so why not Trackmania? The mapper decides how many laps there are, so pay attention to how many times you have to complete the route. It's not great to think you're done only to crash. When building, the main thing to watch out for is the transition into the second lap. It can be a bit tricky to make something that's good to drive when starting out and when you're coming through again with a lot more speed. So don't just place a sharp turn after the start the players will constantly crash into. Give it some thought and make sure things are smooth. Now if only we could get the Mario Kart final lap music in here. I've talked about most surfaces and styles, but that's not all the car goes through. Reactor maps are the maps that are dedicated to the reactor blocks and the interactions with everything else. These are the blocks that cause fire to come out of the wheels and either boost the car up or push it down, depending on the orientation the car drives over them. Either direction, the car accelerates a lot faster and the maps tend to be pretty fast paced. Reactor down lets the car stick to walls and ceilings and reactor up essentially makes the car lighter, causing it to slide more easily and jump farther. Reactor doesn't get cancelled after crossing a checkpoint, it either stops on its own after a few seconds or when the player drives over a reset block. As you can imagine, this lets the car do a huge number of new tricks, and can get some pretty weird physics that give these maps an out of control feeling. This can be paired with any surface, as long as reactors are used for a good portion of the map, it's a reactor map. When driving these routes, expect flashy tricks and tricky elements. As far as building goes, since any surface can be used, a lot of it is up to you. The biggest thing to watch out for are cuts and zoops. Reactor maps are notorious for having shortcuts the mapper never intended. Because of the weird physics, players can do some pretty insane things, so unless you really make sure that there is no other way, players will find a way around the reset block to keep the reactor way longer than you intended. Double, triple, and quadruple check for alternate routes, because as soon as the reactor players see the effect, they're gonna start looking. But even if they spot something, at least the world record will look cool. Next up is the premier style of the map review server, LOL. Like the name suggests, these maps aren't meant to be taken seriously. Instead, they're mostly built as jokes to torture other players. So, anything goes. At least the map themselves tend to be pretty short, with most being in the 15 to 30 second range. Since the people who make these maps love to watch other players suffer, some of the more common surfaces include ice, penalty surfaces, and wet plastic. Usually not all at once together, but you never know. Not all lol maps are sadistic trolls, there are a few that have a lot of time, energy, and thought put into them that explore what it would truly feel like to be stuck in a washing machine strapped to a jackhammer. Others are built in 5 minutes because the author had a few too many Red Bulls that evening, and because these maps can be churned out one after another in no time at all, map review is full of players spamming lol maps for their own amusement. 
but thankfully they tend to do this at quieter times when not that many people are looking for actual feedback. It can get kind of annoying, especially since you can't leave or else your map gets taken out of the queue. But as much as people like to complain, map review is actually one of the best places for these creations, since most players aren't going out of their way to find and play lol maps, and each map is only up for three minutes. So the mapper gets guaranteed players, and by the time the map gets old, it's only a little bit until the next one appears. I may poke fun, but I get it. When it comes to building lol maps, these are the easiest to build by far. I mean, you can literally do whatever you want. Any surface, any element, any difficulty, it's all fair game. As someone who has spent a lot of time in the map review server, I do appreciate it when a lol map does something really out of the ordinary. I don't like to hate, but I've played more than my fair share of red boosters into tight bobsled turns, and variety is the spice of life, you know? That being said, lol maps can be a great learning tool. These routes tend to be built by newer players and going into the map editor to just throw something together you think is cool and funny is perfect for learning the controls and seeing what blocks fit together. But I swear, if you keep submitting these lol maps when I'm in the server just to make me angry. Okay, okay, let's back up a little bit. Keep going, keep going, perfect. You're now driving a backwards map. As the name suggests, instead of driving the map while facing forwards, these maps are driven while the car is backwards. This changes the physics of the car turning quite a bit. Acceleration is pretty slow, so the maps tend to be very momentum based, with the main mechanic being speed slides. Just like with full speed, the best way of gaining speed isn't to maintain full grip. However, the slides are a lot different and change depending on the surface you're driving on, but they do work at all speeds. For grass, you want about 60 to 75% overlap with your skid marks. Dirt, the overlap is around 50%. On road, you don't want any overlap. A gap between your skids is actually faster with the gap getting smaller the faster you are. And for plastic, wiggles are your best option. If a corner is too sharp to slide, the car actually turns very tight while maintaining grip, so no slides are preferred around those tight bends. And honestly, that's pretty much backwards driving. Maps will test your ability to hold speed slides and cancel them to make tight corners, going over a variety of surfaces to mix things up. To guarantee that you aren't going forwards, backwards boosters are often placed throughout the map. Going in forwards would normally slow you down and prevent you from passing, but reversing through doesn't, ensuring that going backwards is the optimal strategy. Because of these weird mechanics, there's going to be a large gap between the people who know and don't know the strategies, so keep that in mind when mapping. Backward maps are a bit like full speed, where you have to build with the idea of speed slides, but since you aren't going as fast, it's easier to course correct. So building backwards routes might be more of a knowledge check. These maps are pretty rare, so the backwards community will be thankful. More of a building challenge than a driving style, but here's free blocking anyway. Basically, the entire map is built using the free block tool and includes some pretty crazy angles on the normal pieces. Unfortunately, this is a style exclusive to PC as console builders don't have access to free blocking. Since this is more of a restriction while building, the mapper does have to decide on a style to pair with this. The most common ones I've seen are dirt and tech. Dirt is the grippiest of the slippery surfaces, kind of a weird sentence, so the car won't be sliding off the weird angles as easily, and there are some neat physics tricks to play off of as well. Tech, on the other hand, uses the weird angles to help set up for drifts and tight corners. You can use free blocking for pretty much any style, so if you feel like it, experiment. The biggest thing is to make sure that the blocks are still fitting well together and that the transitions are smooth. No one wants to drive a map where you're constantly clipping weird edges and getting landing bugs. I mean, you can pretty much put the blocks whatever, so take advantage of it. And now we go from being free from the grid to free from pressing gas. Look, I don't know, transitions are weird. Free wheel maps. These take advantage of the engine off block to make a map where the car coasts down without the gas pedal. Engine off blocks are placed at each checkpoint to ensure you never get that engine back. While there can be some uphill sections, jumps, and drifts, a majority of the map will be downhill, with the main goal of maneuvering the turns and obstacles keeping as much speed as possible. Since you don't have the engine, speed slides don't exist, and you'll have to figure out how to slide slash drift as little as possible. 
It's easier said than done, however, and the maps are built to test that ability. Pretty much any surface can be used in these maps, except for ice. People have included ice before in their free will maps, but it, it's more of a test to see how straight you can keep your car. There are no ice lights here, so you can't really turn. Outside of that, it's all fair game. When mapping, there are a few things to keep in mind. Make sure that the map is doable even if you double respawn at each checkpoint. The places that are easy to crash should be near a downhill as that's the only place players can recover. And as I mentioned before, stay clear of ice. Outside of that, should be good to go. And now it's time to look at the complete opposite of free wheel, press forwards. Mostly called PF maps to keep it short, these maps are very simple and feature routes that can only be completed by holding gas and nothing else. To keep the maps entertaining, the routes themselves often feature insane flips, tricks, reactor flights, and much more. Technically speaking, a more proper name would be single input maps, as routes have been made that can be completed by holding both gas and left, for example. Basically, any map that has you holding a button combination for the entire duration falls under this umbrella. But PF maps are the most common by far and are the first things players think of. Once you hold that input combination, the map dries itself. Because of all the insane tricks you can do, these routes tend to be most popular with newer players. After all, if you're still trying to figure out what the car can do, seeing it be launched across the arena at high speeds while doing a million flips is pretty exciting. On the other hand, when you've seen that a few times before, it stops being so cool. PF maps have a reputation of being really boring as you're just sitting there not doing anything, and it can be very challenging to create a route with elements people haven't seen before. Some builders work around this by syncing their routes to music, taking popular songs and placing map elements that line up with what's happening in them. That's also assuming they work. There are a ton of ways PF maps break, and some of them can be really weird. The obvious ways are physics updates, especially since the multiple ice updates, we have a ton of broken PF maps. But the more interesting ways are wiggling your mouse and spamming the horn. For whatever reason, these actions affect your car the slightest amount. And when the map is perfectly calibrated, that slight interruption will throw your car off course. Really weird, don't know why it happens, but it does. When mapping, PF is really up to you. I would recommend keeping the speeds high as watching a slow car isn't as exciting. It may seem counterintuitive at first, but place checkpoints. Every time I see a PF map without checkpoints, players inevitably stop holding gas and just drive to the finish instead. People naturally want to drive maps faster, so it will be the same for your map. The way to avoid this is to place checkpoints and to ensure that the finish is only reachable through the intended route. This is really the style that just goes absolutely insane. Including blocks that the car narrowly misses is another good way to make the route more exciting. All because the style is popular with newer players doesn't mean builders can't show skill. Seeing a very well calculated and complicated PF map is something most players will still enjoy. And if you're really good, you can even have the honor of making it to the background of a random TikTok. One of the more infamous map styles with one of the most popular events, Khaki. The name comes from Kak, which is German for shit. At the start, the maps were basically really hard shit posts. Over the years, the maps have become more respected, for the most part, but they retain their difficulty. In fact, they keep getting more ridiculous and harder each year. Speaking of which, there are two khaki events per year, one on Trackmania Nations Forever and one on Trackmania 2020. The style is basically the same. Each map is built around some sort of gimmick. It can be a trick, bug, exploit, you name it. The idea is then built into a route that really stretches the idea of what is humanly possible. Even within khaki, there are some subgenres. Some maps are more skill based, while others are 100% dependent on luck. Either way, when you spend hours on a single map, you aren't spending that time trying to grind down your personal PB. You're just trying to get a single finish. Once you do get that finish, it's time to start grinding a different map. Because the event only lasts a month and the winner isn't the one who has the overall best times, it's the player who's finished the most maps. And there are 75 maps in total for each event. It doesn't have to be part of the official event to be a khaki map, but that's when khaki maps get played the most and what most mappers are shooting for. 
As far as mapping, I don't know if I can help much there. Just pick a trick, exploit, bug, whatever, and see how difficult of a map you're willing to make with it. That being said, there is an application process to get your map into the main event. So if you're hoping for that, then put up some scenery. And make sure your map is either flashy or seems somewhat doable. I'm sure building a big jump and trying to make it into a tiny finish on the other side of the arena is difficult, but it's a bit too simple. Otherwise, have fun with it and enjoy the clips of people smashing their monitors with the satisfaction that this is all your fault. Now it's time for another style that you'll be playing for hours, but in a much different way. RPG maps get their name from the video game genre with the same name. No, your car isn't the chosen one of a burnt down village where you'll eventually kill God. Instead, these maps are all about exploration and using the environment to get to the next checkpoint. The way to go isn't always obvious, so you're encouraged to jump around, climb, and drive to see where you can go. It's very common for the checkpoints to be numbered, so you should know what you're looking for. RPG maps tend to be very heavily themed with some of the best scenery the game has ever seen. Some do include a small story as you go through it, taking more inspiration from video game RPGs in general, but this aspect is optional. The route itself is very rarely smooth, with the emphasis more on testing the player's ability to find the path than on perfectly calculated speed drifts. Speaking of the elements you might find, this is where you'll see some interesting ways to get to new locations. At least, figuring out an RPG map was the first time I had to drive on top of a checkpoint as part of the intended route. The biggest thing when driving RPG is to keep an open mind and be patient with yourself. It's very easy to get lost and frustrated when you don't know where to go, but very rewarding when you finally figure it out. The length of these maps can vary quite a bit. Some RPGs take a few minutes to drive through, while others take several hours. So it might be best to look at the metal times before fully committing to figuring one out. As far as building goes, RPG maps are very difficult to put together. Players are going in with the expectation of exploration. And one of the more frustrating aspects is driving through a checkpoint you weren't supposed to take yet. Hence, why they're commonly numbered. I would recommend building shorter RPG maps until you're more confident than going for the longer routes. The best RPG mappers guarantee that you can only reach the intended checkpoint, but that's easier said than done. As long as you number those checkpoints, it should be fine. Probably one of the more accepted map styles to spend 10 minutes on the route and 100 hours on the scenery. RPG does have a smaller cousin, Pathfinding. These maps are also focused on exploration, but are usually in a much smaller area. Instead of driving around trying to find the next checkpoint, they should all be very easy to find and collect. The challenge is figuring out which order to take the checkpoints in to get the best time. Pathfinding maps are built without an official route in mind. Instead, players are challenged to find their own way through all the obstacles and elements, taking the checkpoints in whatever order they choose. Or they can copy world record, either one. The maps tend to be entirely within a well-defined area, so the player doesn't get too lost looking for everything. Hopefully, the mapper let the players know how many checkpoints they're looking for, and if you're on console, you do have to keep track, as PC players can download a checkpoint counter plugin, which I do recommend. But once you know the map, it doesn't really matter anymore. Building a pathfinding map seems like it should be super easy. I mean, you can just scatter some checkpoints around and call it good, which is technically true, but speaking from personal experience, there is a large difference between a pathfinding map and a fun pathfinding map. A well-built and calculated map should have multiple routes that feel like they could be the fastest, even if only one is truly the fastest, and should feature fun elements and obstacles to go through. That way, even if someone is on the fastest route, they still have to push themselves for that PB. So try some new things and don't be afraid to introduce decisions to the player. I'm sure they'll figure it out. Don't confuse the player too much though. You might end up with a puzzle map. With these maps, the way to the finish isn't clear. At some point, it might even seem impossible. Unlike Khaki, where the difficulty comes with the tricks required to beat the map, the hard part about puzzle maps is figuring out what to do in the first place. Depending on the puzzle map itself, you might have to take advantage of bugs, but not always. Sometimes it's just an abstract path to the finish. Thanks to the ability to have custom signs and the media tracker, the most elaborate puzzle maps can be entire escape rooms. 
when driving these maps, just try to keep your cool and have an open mind. Just try not to look at the world record too quickly. When creating these maps, my recommendation is similar to RPG. Start with some smaller puzzle maps, maybe just showing off a trick or two, and then getting more elaborate. Make sure that there's no other way to complete the route other than the intended way, and unless you want to be really mean, try not to build areas where the player can get stuck. Other than that, get creative. See what you can do with the resources in the map editor, you might be able to push them farther than you think. So what if someone took a khaki map and made it three hours long? Okay, <laughs> maybe the difficulty isn't that high, but trial maps are still hard. It obviously depends on the map, but these routes consist of difficult tricks the player has to land to progress. With these maps, you know where to go, but getting there is the issue. Sometimes it requires perfect ice slides, other times you have to full speed a pipe turn, and you just know there's going to be some insane jumps as well. Unlike Khaki, these maps tend to rely very little on bugs. Instead, trial maps are more of an expression of raw skill and dedication, where the hardest maps really test the top player's knowledge, patience, and ability. Unless it's a short map, expect to be playing the map for a few hours. That's a lot of time spent respawning and trying the same sections over and over again, but many players will tell you it's worth it when you finally get it. Completing a trial map is an accomplishment in and of itself, so try not to rage too hard. When building trial maps, the most important thing is to make sure that the intended way is the only way. If someone can bonk off the scenery to make a jump easier, they will do it. I also recommend starting small and gradually building larger and larger trial maps. Especially if you're packing a lot of tricks into a small space, the odds of accidentally creating a few cuts go up tremendously. And it would be a shame to spend all that time creating these obstacles only for a couple plastic bounces to ruin the map. Other than that, almost anything goes. I don't think people will actually play a three hour long khaki map. Well, uh, I mean, there has to be someone crazy enough to do it. But remember, you do have to validate the map. So consider yourself as you're building. And don't use the validator plugin either. If you're going to build a four hour long pipe maze, the least you can do is set the author time yourself. All right, so that's all of the styles I'm covering, but there are still a few terms I would like to go over. Endurance, short, and mini. These refer to how long each map is and can be combined with any style. For instance, you can have an endurance dirt map or a mini trial map. But what do these mean? Most people tend to use endurance to describe maps that are over two minutes long. These maps test the player's ability to focus on driving for extended periods of time. If the map is between 15 to 30 seconds, that's a short map. Usually there are a few elements to get through and not much else. I really like building these when I'm testing out possible ideas to turn into full maps later. If the map is below 15 seconds, that's mini. These maps only have room for a couple elements and there are several mappers who constantly make entire campaigns out of 10 seconds maps. So if you see these keywords describing a map, you know what to expect. You might notice that there is a time gap between endurance and short and that's because going from 30 seconds to about a minute and a half reaching that two minute mark, that's the expected map length. Especially with track of the day, the meta for maps have really been around 45 seconds. So if you don't see any of these tags, it should be around that length. Oh, I think that's it. I know I didn't include absolutely everything, but all the styles I covered will be good for 99% of maps. Did you notice anything I missed? Any information I left out? Let me know in the comments down below. This is definitely the longest video I've ever made for this channel, and it will stay that way for the foreseeable future. This was a lot of work, and I would like to put out at least a couple videos per month. If you learned something, I would ap appreciate you liking the video. I make videos about mapping, so if you want to join me on my journey to becoming a decent Trackmania mapper, hit that subscribe button. If you have any topics you would like me to go over, let me know. I still have lots of ideas, but I might bump some up the list. In case you're still watching, I would just like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch my video. I really do appreciate it, but if you'll excuse me, I'm about to create the world's best ice khaki endurance map. Bye!